three, two, one. Imagine your parents, they're like aliens to each other. Your mom is super, super strong. Mm. She's over six feet tall with long flowing hair that ruffles in the wind. And your dad is a... Very, very cute. (laughs) He's got short, stumpy legs, huge ears, buck teeth, and some say a kind of jerky personality. And as these two different species of animals come together to form you, the genes inside your cells... They're basically speaking two different languages. So you have two separate sets of directions of how to make you, how you're going to operate in the world. Your legs bulge long and strong like your mom's. And your feet scrunch into tiny hooves like your dad's, and when you finally come out into the world, you open your eyes and see how you don't really fit into either species or either world. Some people say a mashup of species like you is impossible. And yet, here you are. You're a mule. All right, now is the part where I make you sing the theme song with me. Okay. (laughs) Terrestrials, terrestrials, we are not the worst, we are the best. Trials. Yep, correct. (laughs) Okay. Terrestrials is a show where we uncover the strangeness waiting right here on Earth and sometimes break out into song. There's so much to discover if you're super cool. Terrestrials, terrestrials. This last episode is about a mule. Terrestrials, terrestrials. Good voice is not required. I am your host, Lula Miller, joined as always by my song bud. Howdy, partner. Alan. Giddy up. And today we are telling the story of a humble mule named Peanut, who one summer day did something so rare that it shattered one of the most sacred laws of nature. What was that blasphemous thing you were saying? What, about carrots? Yeah. No thanks. Don't like them? Don't like carrots. So to understand this story, the song bud and I grabbed a bunch of carrots, hopped in a car and headed down to Kentucky. Oh, horses. To hear how it happened straight from the horses or a mule's mouth. Pulling up to a gorgeous farm with purple balloons. I don't know if those are for the guest of honor <gasps> or somebody else. So first, All right. All right. we met Peanut's owners, Jerry and Teresa Smothers. I'm Jerry. Great to see ya. <laughs> I'm Teresa. I'm Lulu. Then we met their mother. This is my mother-in-law, Lily. This mother's mother. This is my mother, Susie. That there sniffing the mic is their dog, Ginger. Hi, Hi Ginger. Next, we Hi. met their cat, Tony, their son, Justin, their grandniece. Carly Ann. And finally... So this is Peanut? That's Peanut. Peanut herself. Do you have anything to say, Peanut? <laughs> yeah, that's not a carrot. That was my microphone she was trying to eat. It's a really expensive carrot. (laughs) So our story starts when Peanut starts. She was born in 1999, and she came out with chocolatey brown fur and a punk rock blonde mohawk of a mane. We fell in love with her. Teresa and Jerry had been in the market for a new farm animal, and so they brought little Peanut back to their farm and thought they knew what they were getting themselves into. Things started out normally enough. They made a home for her in their stable. They introduced her to their little three-year-old niece, Hannah. So we would set Hannah on her, and Jerry would hold Hannah, and I would lead Peanut. Well, Peanut would do that for a little while. Walking peacefully, until suddenly... She'd start bucking. Well, the more she bucked, the more Hannah loved it. No. Yes. (laughs) As time went on, the Smothers added more and more animals to their farm. Cows and... Big horses. And little Peanut. She would try to manipulate the horses to do what she wanted them to do. She'd turn her back in and kick. And buck and nudge her way to the front of the line. And get in there where she can eat or get a treat or whatever it is. It turned out Peanut was... Bossy. 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 Good word, bossy. And that part didn't surprise the Smothers. You know, mules are stubborn. 
This stubbornness is probably what mules are most famous for. Ever heard the expression, stubborn as a mule? If someone's calling you mulish, they mean you should probably give up on the thing that you won't stop trying to do. It's a diss. And this obstinance is why mules don't have the greatest reputation. All right. And down in the Pate Valley with five loaded mules. But for the small subset of people who do love mules, like James Reeves here, a mule packer who spends his days riding mules over massive mountains to bring food and supplies to remote trail workers, he says mules aren't the worst, but literally the best parts of both of their parents. He says they've got the strength of a horse in the compact size of a donkey, meaning they can lug heavy gear just as long and far as a horse while eating way less food. Trail is really rugged going down here. A lot of rocks. Plus, their little hooves make them far better at navigating treacherous, narrow mountain trails than horses. They're also less prone to injury. They're less likely to spook and run off if something surprises them. And they can withstand the blazing sun for hours longer than horses or donkeys. We're at about 4,000 feet elevation which here in California can get pretty hot in the summer. And their superpowers do not stop when the sun goes down. They keep coyotes out of the field. So farmers use them for their cattle. That way these coyotes can't, you know, get the babies. So they will kill a coyote. Okay, I'm picturing like a pack of coyotes, Mm -hmm. fangs, and then like a sweet little mule. The the mule's gonna win? Yeah, every time. Kicking. Yeah, probably the single biggest benefit is their stubbornness. Yep, that mulish stubbornness that so many people love to hate, James over the years has come to see as mule's very best feature. He told me about one time he was riding a mule and it suddenly stopped. And no matter how much he kicked or pulled at it, it would not move. And finally, James saw why. There was a rattlesnake there on the trail. (gasps) And the mule had hurt the snake, I think. And I had it. And they was trying to tell me, no, I'm not going to do that because it's dangerous. And that's kind of a typical thing that happens with people a lot. They mistake higher intelligence for stubbornness. James is not alone in this interpretation. A 2008 study found that mules perform better than horses and donkeys on tests for visual awareness and learning, suggesting they might be quantifiably the smartest of all the equids. Yeah. And this trifecta of strength, fuel efficiency, and intelligence is why mules are more deeply a part of human history than you may realize. Humans have been breeding mules since ancient times. They've carried turquoise and gold and silver out of mines. They've carried the supplies that have allowed us to build train tracks all over the globe. They're gentle enough to safely carry school children over treacherous peaks and tough enough to lug cannon-like weapons into battle. They've even changed the flow of the oceans by helping to dig canals and helped us to build temples so high they sometimes touch the clouds. But these ultra-strong, cognitively supercharged, coyote-kicking, anamorph superheroes do have one glitch. Mules don't have babies. Yep, they're not going to have children of their own, which we call infertile. This is evolutionary biologist Dr. Molly Schumer. We heard her voice at the very beginning describing what it's like to be a mule. Your parents, they're like aliens to each other. And she says the reason mules can't have babies all goes back to those parents. Quick refresher, a mule's parents are two different species, a horse and a donkey. And for a long time, scientists thought that a mashup of creatures like this was not supposed to happen in nature. Hybrid beasts like a horse with eagle wings or a human with a fishtail were thought to belong in the realm of fantasy or myths or fairy tales or, you know, lies. 
And while you might be able to artificially engineer a mashup like a mule or a liger, a lion and a tiger, or a zonkey, a zebra and a donkey, all those things can exist by forcing their parents to breed, nature had barriers in place that should never allow a man-made creation like that to carry on. And those rules, those hard and fast barriers between species, became visible, or so scientists thought, when they first glimpsed these structures inside the cell called chromosomes. All right, now before you shut off this year radio program, we are going to explain chromosomes as a line dance. So put on your cowboy hats. Now DNA makes up your genes, genes make up your chromosomes. Chromosomes are inside your cells, and cells make up your body. Now hold your horses, Songbird. What'd you just say? Come on, Lulu, keep up. The DNA makes up your genes, and genes make up your chromosomes. Chromosomes are inside your cells, and cells make up your body. Genetic code is a fancy way to say the DNA inside your genes. So it's the reason why my eyes are blue and maybe yours are brown or green? Yep, critters, plants, and all things alive have chromosomes with genes inside. But here's where things start getting strange. Tell us, Lulu, what Molly say? Well, Dr. Molly, let us know how every species has its own special number of chromosomes that hold its cells' genetic code. Corn on the cob! What's the number again? 20, my friend. Two sets of 10. And what about dolphins? 44. Red foxes? They have 34. And duckbill platypus. How about them? 52 for our duckbill friend. And pretty little donkeys. How do they do? Yeehaw, they have 62. But tell me, horsies, they have more? They got exactly 64. 62. And to make a baby, the chromosomes inside each parent have to do a little line dance. It's just got two parts. First, you gotta split your chromosomes in half. Half on the right. Half on the left. But the next part, Molly says, is way harder. What do they have to do, Dr. Molly? All the chromosomes have to line up with their partner. 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 It's a chromosome. Do see do. How to make an embryo. Get into a nice straight line and swing your partner to recombine. When parents are the same species, the dance is smooth. But when the numbers don't match, things can get confused. And most of the time, life just can't be. But a horse and a donkey found a way to agree. They found the sweet spot right between 62 and 64. 63. So a mule's got 63 inside. When it grows up and tries to make more life, it lines right up for that same line dance. It's chromosomes all ready to break. It's, it's a chromosome. do si do How, how to, to make an embryo. Get into a nice, nice straight line and swing your partner to recombine. So 63 chromosomes split in half. Half on the right. Half on the left. Oh, uh, wait. Half of 63 is... Uh-oh. What happens in the case of a mule that has 63 chromosomes is it ends up with this sort of problem where not all the chromosomes are matched to a partner and it can't split in half properly. Wait, so it's just as simple as like you you have to have an even number so it can be divided by two? Yeah. And so since 63 divided by two is 31 and a half. Exactly. That, That's the problem. Does that... What's so bad about having 31 and a half yeah. chromosomes? What makes that such a problem? So in a lot of cases, what happens is the cell is lining up the chromosomes to divide and it's like checking. Is everything ready? Is it okay to divide? And then it can see that things aren't lined up properly. It's, it's the, the chromosome. chromosome. do do How to make an embryo. If you can't divide in two. Well, there's a... Nothing left to do. Show's over, folks. No babies are being made tonight. Who knew, like, life was such a stickler for clean math? Yeah, (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) And this scientific certainty has clomped its way out to farm country. Jerry and Teresa said that growing up, this was just a thing you knew about mules. They have odd chromosomes, and so if you have odd chromosomes, you can't have a baby. Yep. That's what we've always heard. There's even an expression. When a mule has a baby, it's like when pigs fly. Never going to happen. Hey, Peanut. And so back to Peanut. Is is nose petting cool? Yes. Hi. For years, she roamed the fields of the Smothers Farm, 
<laughs> Liv laugh hoofing it up. Her chocolatey brown fur slowly starting to gray. You can kind of see the, the white and the gray around her eyes and nose. That spunky spirit starting to slow down. We kind of notice that, you know, she's, she's starting to show her age a little bit. And as she nears 20 years old, Jerry and Teresa are sure that because those 63 chromosomes inside her will never be able to divide neatly in half, that'll be it for Peanut in their lives. No babies coming to carry on her memories or spirit. You always think about that. Of course, yeah. yes. And that should be how the story ends. But it's not. More in a moment. You're listening to Terrestrials. We are telling the story of a mule named Peanut, whose life was pretty uneventful for 17 years. Yeah, just here on the farm, eating, uh, bossing the other animals around. (laughs) Until Um, one morning, in July of 2018, Jerry gets a call from his neighbor Sam, a guy who has a bunch of donkeys that Peanut sometimes goes over to boss around. Sam called, and he said, well, your mules had a baby. And I said, Sam, you're mistaken and getting old because (laughs) mules can't have babies. And he said, well, you should have told her that before she got pregnant. Jerry says there's no way, but Sam insists. Jerry, it's here. I'm here looking at it. (laughs) Jerry tells Teresa what Sam has just told him. And I said, oh, he don't know what he's talking about. He's old and senile. I said, said, there's no way. (laughs) But they head on over to Sam's farm just to check it out. And I'll never forget it. There was their peanut. In the corner of the field in a fence line with the baby. This light gray, mule-looking thing with a funny puff of blonde hair on top of its head. Everybody was running, and she just tumbled over because she had this big head up here, you know, and this little bitty body. Like the weight was all off balance. Yes. And even though no one saw the birth... You just knew. You just knew because when Peanut moved, that baby moved. Mm -hmm. And stranger still... While Peanut couldn't make any milk, because, you know, not a thing mules should ever need to do. She had clear liquid coming from her teats. I mean, it was a shock. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, this isn't supposed to happen. This is the Smothers' neighbor, Destiny, who was 14 years old when the little filly was born. Yes. And I and think, then, and we did say, we, we said, oh my gosh, up. this is a miracle. And yeah. I'm like, well, that's a perfect name. Miracle. That's what they named her. It just fits so perfectly, so. And the Smothers asked Destiny to help them keep little Miracle fed. I got to bottle feed her, I think, three times a day. What? Yes, it was amazing. What was bottle feeding like? Like, what what milk were you using? And would you go sit down with her? Would you stand? Well, we either put it between our legs a plastic bottle full of a baby formula made from cow's milk. So it was kind of like a real thing of what she would actually do with her mom. Oh, yeah. Or you'd put it in the armpit so that she could nuzzle a little bit. (gasps) Was that like the coziest thing on the planet? I loved it. It was was hard not to smile the whole time and just laugh because it was just so (laughs) cute. I interrupt the cutest scene in Kentucky to ask a very pressing question. What about the chromosomes? How did this mule have a baby, Molly? What the hoof is going on? Yeah, so it's really uncomfortable as a scientist to speculate. But one thing to know about evolution is that the mistakes are important. Molly says if you'd asked her about 15 years ago when she was in college, she would have told us what her professors were telling her, which is that this baby was a mistake. Somehow, nature let a little bad math slide through, And indeed, over the centuries, there have been a tiny number of confirmed cases of mules giving birth. 
But according to the scientific rules, those quote-unquote mistakes with their mismatched chromosomes inside should have such serious problems trying to grow that they'd be unable to survive, which we call inviable. And sure enough, it was probably was it four, four, four or five days after Miracle was born. She stopped eating and she just laid around and she couldn't walk. Their neighbor Sam stops by one day and sees Miracle lying down, lifeless. He thought she was dead. And he slunked home to get a shovel, to dig a hole for Miracle, to bury her. But when Teresa and Jerry came back later that day, they saw Miracle was still breathing, though she was struggling. So they rushed her to the animal hospital. Yes. So they shaved her neck and they put IVs in her and they gave her all of this medicine and it was very costly. And each day we were like, you know, what are we going to do? We can't. So here, here they are. Aww. Jerry pulls out a photo on his phone from that time. Wow, so it's like this little mule in hay surrounded by all these <laughs> surgeon-looking folks. Yeah, and see, there yeah. they are working on her. Oh, there's Peanut. Did they bring Peanut in to, like, yes. comfort her? Yes, oh, they, she stayed, peanut stayed with her the whole time. Mm. We all prayed in the church. They wait a fifth day. The vet said that, you know, she wasn't going to live. Sixth day. We were sitting up there in the hay and sitting there and boo-hooing. And I said, let's just give her one more day. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. I said, let's give her one more day. And then one of the doctors had the idea of giving Peanut, sweet, old, graying Peanut, some medicine. Called Don Peridon. And it made that liquid turn into milk for Miracle. (gasps) And little Miracle... (laughs) begins suckling milk from Peanut and almost immediately gains weight, strength. She loses her cough. She turned around just like that, and she came home on the seventh day. And as for how long this fragile little mistake lasted after she came home, well... Wow, pulling up to a gorgeous farm with purple balloons. I don't know if those are for the guest of honor. That's why we went out there to Kentucky on that hot July day to meet Miracle for her fourth birthday. She'll be four, yes. Mir- Miracle will be yeah. four. Wow. Well, can we can we go meet the, the birthday girl? Yes. Teresa and Jerry and their moms and son and grandniece led us outside, trailed by their dog and cat into the hot July afternoon. We crossed a big field of grass and then Jerry unlocked a gate and let out a hefty gray creature with donkey ears, horsey eyes, and a long tail that I swear she was wagging. Easy. Easy. Okay. She was no longer wobbly. Hi, Miracle. And in fact, was so strong, she let a fully grown radio lady climb onto her back without flinching. Okay, that might be. Thank you. And that wasn't all. When we busted out the pinata we were so proud to have brought to her birthday party. Tie it on tight. A pinata not in the shape of a mule, as so many pinatas are, but in the shape of a human. Nah. True to her nature. She's wisely not trusting it. <laughs> she stubbornly ignored it. Oh, we're seeing mule obstinance in 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 action. She's like, there's wires sticking out of that thing. I don't want it. (laughs) The mistakes are important. Molly said she'd love to get a peek at Miracle's blood to better understand what exactly is going on with her chromosomes. And the Smothers have sent samples out to labs. But she also said that in the decade and a half since she's been in college, biologists have gotten new tools that have allowed them to see something inside species' secret genetic codes that they hadn't been able to see before. What we learn first in plants, but then later in animals, that actually hybrids were being formed all the time. That's right. It turns out the wilderness is a fantasia of hybrids. Butterflies and crocodiles and grasses and trees that on the inside have been revealed to be wild mixes 
of species. There's been a hybridization between grizzly bears and polar bears. Pizzly bears. Between coyotes and wolves. Coy wolves. Rainbow trout and cutthroat trout. Those species hybridize. Is a cut rainbow called a skittle? Skittle. Fish? Love it. Okay, sorry. I will propose that. Thanks. To my, tell the scientists. Yeah, I, I said will so. tell them. <laughs> There are narlugas, narwhal belugas, and timber diamonds, timber and diamond rattlesnakes, and some people even guess that we are hybrids with a now extinct creature called Neanderthals. Mm. And perhaps wildest of all is that these naturally occurring mashups can have babies and carry on their beautifully blended chromosomes into the future. <laughs> This is why this has been kind of such a fun field to be in now is that it's an area where our thinking has changed dramatically over the past 10 or 15 years. Molly says that these days, scientists no longer think of hybrids as mistakes, flukes, or man-made dead ends. Instead, they seem to be one of the main ways that nature creates new species. And so in the case of Miracle... It wasn't necessarily that the rules got broken so much as we had the rules wrong. Heads up! Heads up! Mind open! We will never stop searching because the world keeps changing! Heads up! Heads up! Mind open! Ears open! Keep your eyes open! You don't have to tell me how easy it is to stay stuck in a box with the things you believe I want to break it down Wake up and reach out Beyond impossibility You don't have to tell me How hard it can be To find the magic When everything feels static But there is so much To discover if you search real close It can seem like a miracle Heads up! Heads up! Minds open! They will never stop searching Cause the world keeps changing Heads up, heads up, minds open Ears open, keep your eyes open No one better tell us they have all the answers When nobody even knows all the questions And we're still learning how we should ask that need to change embrace the way mistakes are made we break away we're not afraid won't hesitate to question everything heads up heads up minds open ears open keep your eyes open heads up heads up minds open ears open keep your eyes Alan Gofinski. Terrestrials was created by me, Lulu Miller, with WNYC Studios. It is produced by the amusing Anna Gonzalez and Alan Gofinski, plus me, with help from Susie Lechtenberg, Sarah Sambach, Natalia Ramirez, Natalie Mead, Miriam Bernard, David Gable, Joe Plord, and Sarita Bott. Sound design and additional editorial guidance by Phoebe Wang. Clumpity clump. Our advisors are Fian Griffith, Aaliyah Elijah, Dominique Shabazz, Liza Steinberg Demby, and Tara Welty. Terrestrials is supported in part by Science Sandbox, an initiative of the Simons Foundation. Special thanks to Boomer Guys, Amy Pearl, Danielle Alarcon, the Shamillo family, Julie Abodili, and the Wheeler School, Charlottesville's Music Resource Center, Canelo Joaquin, Brianna Gutierrez, and the Park equine hospital and that'll do it nothing else cool about it oh, what's that excuse me i have a question me two me three me four the badgers listeners with badgering questions for the expert are you ready yeah yeah Yeehaw. my name is odessa i'm eight 
Do mules say hee-haw or only donkeys? It's actually called braying. So a horse neighs <laughs> and a mule brays. <laughs> They've all got their own voice, same as us. Hmm. I would have thought it would have been neha for a little hybrid of nay plus hee I guess that's a negative. Hi, I'm Erin, and I'm 35. I hear that there are more pizzly bears due to climate change. Is this true? And is this new animal here to stay? That is a fantastic question. So it is actually true, and um, we're seeing this a lot in a lot of different species. And this is because with climate change, Species are having to move around to find the right environments for them. So, for example, you might see grizzly bears moving further north because it's less harsh in the winter. And then you can get contact between species that previously didn't have contact and new opportunities Hmm. for hybridization. And do you think that these polar bear grizzly bear hybrids are here to stay? Yeah, I mean, I think humans have been changing the environment so much that I do think that we are going to see a lot of new hybridization events, and some of those will stick around. I I hope the pizzly bears make it. Do you think humans are accelerating the rate of hybrids? Yeah, I've seen a couple of papers start to come out saying that hybridization might be increasing in frequency right now, Hmm. mainly because we're just changing everything really fast. Hmm. Oh, interesting. That's cool. But this, I guess the sad note on that is like, on one hand, I'm like, oh, more zonkeys and pizzlies <laughs> and ligers and a world of blends. But is it out of this kind of desperate necessity? Yeah. Or are sort of species leaving their ranks and coming together to combine <laughs> because humans are stealing so much habitat that they have to come together to just survive. Like, is there a bittersweetness in that beauty of novelty? I definitely think that's bittersweet. You know, it's a result of massive changes that that humans have, have made. So, I'll leave it there. Two roads diverging, and you can walk either one. Do nothing and let more and more animals hybridize, making wild beasts beyond the imagination. Or do your part to try to conserve what's here and notice all the variety that already exists alongside you. But the weight of the world is not on your shoulders alone. Our best hope of making change is by coming together. So we've put a bunch of concrete and even kind of fun things we can all do to help protect the non-human life on this planet. You can find that on our website, terrestrialspodcast.org. We also have a very silly animation of a game show we played with Dr. Molly called Will They Hybridize? That'll do it for this season of Terrestrials, but I cannot shut down this dance party without saying the deepest thank you to Anna Gonzalez and Alan Gafinski. This show, this little world, would not exist without your immense talents. Thank you also to Chuck Cheeseman, Watif Nasser, Ellen Horn, Jad Abumrad, Soren Wheeler, and the whole Radiolab crew for your support of this thing in various flavors along the way. And finally, be dazzled in rhinestone hearts thanks to Alita Gafinski, Jeff the Earther, Mateus, and Grace Miller. Y'all helped make this, too. To all two of you left still listening, uh, if anyone tells you that they've got it all figured out, I've got news for you. They don't. Your brain weighs just and the earth would weigh 13,170 million trillion pounds With too many surprises to wrap my little